Right, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Oh, there's our two earwigs out there at the moment, Jay and Sid. I'll put them down in the background in a minute. They can say hello to everybody. Um, and tonight going? we're going to have a tonight we're going to have a little bit of audience partition participation as to what we're going to do with this uh, <coughs> vase that we've got here, as far as decorating and painting and everything goes. So I'll change cameras over and I'll put them in the background. Oh, we disappeared. Rightio. Now, the story so far. I've sanded out just about the inside of this now. I've altered the shape a little bit here. Those of you that saw it last week knew it had a little cove here and there. I had to take half an inch off the top because I drilled down so far with the bit that it uh, put the jar in too far inside. So now it sits in there nicely. <coughs> we're just <coughs> we're just a little bit of the rim sitting out, so you can get it out again to take it out and fill it with water and clean it. So I'm just going to show you how I sand the inside first and then I'll go on to doing the outside of it. Get the tool rest out of the way. <coughs> and uh, Jappy has come in. Um, now, Colin has come in. <coughs> Robert has come in. Good evening all. Most unusual weather down here. It's actually 21 degrees in the workshop tonight. Very balmy. And humidity, humid. So I'll just switch that camera over again so as you can see. Now, Tommy's just come in. Hello, Tommy. I have a thing that if I have to put my fingers in further than that, past my second knuckle, then I'll use something else. In this case, it's just a dowel with a slot down the end of it, like that, with sandpaper inserted in it. Temple boys just come in. Okay, Steve, and you just sand it in like that. Now you can use forceps as well, or you can use these little things. If the hole's big enough, flap sand as they're called, you put that into a drill and just, I'll, I'll actually do it. That uh, does a good job actually inside those vases and things. So that's the inside sanded out. Now we'll start on the outside. Start at 120. Switch the extractors on. Sorry about the noise. Now, if you have a question, put a question in front of it. I'll just switch that off. Just switch that off a minute. If you have a question, put question marks in front of it or question. And I'll take a break about every five or ten minutes and Sid will read them out to me to save interrupting while I'm working away here. Uh, I've just come in. <laughs> And the fillets a little bit. Try to keep those no edges nice and sharp here. Yeah. 
start a fire and you want that one. Now I've left the base nice and thick at the moment. Do all your sanding while everything is still rigidly held. Up to 180. Forty. Three twenty. Michael Smith has just come in. G'day Michael, how are you? And 400. Right, that's all the sanding done. Switch this noisy thing off. Okay, first question for the audience. Oh, geez, Darren, do you want to stay here or not? <laughs> do, I, do I put a little bit of a decorated rim around the top here? Or do I just leave it plain like that? Waiting for your answers. Silent minority. I think it's just a bit slow, Robbo. Yeah, yeah. Two for decorate. Pete from Twisted Trees has just joined. Good day, Pete. How are you? Three for decorate. Now, another little trick that I do with my tool tool post is I have a Soren nice has just joined. G'day, Soren. I uh, put it at the height that I want it. Normally, I've got a nice collar or a hose clip on here so that when you're turning it around, it doesn't lose height all the time and you just have to lock it into place. Okay, we're going to decorate it. James Pritchard just come in. G'day, James. So I think about here. Right up to the rim. And we'll have a look. Oh yeah, that looks pretty spiff. Can you see that in the camera? Yeah, you just can. All right. Now, because we've done that, it really should be uh, <coughs> defined a little bit. The edge, I'm not worried about this top one, but I'll just put a little groove down in there at the bottom of those. Have a look and see what that looks like. Right, sand that off at 400. Get rid of any. 
and it rises little bits off there. Yeah, that feels pretty cool. All right. Uh, now, need a cloth and some metho. <coughs> Just wash all the dust out of the way. So Darren just asked if you use a spindle gouge to do that groove, Robert. Yes, I use the spindle gouge. Uh, normally I would have used the skew chisel, but um, the skew chisel is about five paces away and the microphone lead is only about two and a half paces away. So I'd have had to either take the mic off or uh, take my jacket off or something to get at it. So I just used the spindle gadget. It was nice and close handy. You can read Steve's yourself. Sorry? Too late. Sorry, Good Steve. Good day, Guy. How are you? Yes, we're going to see a little bit of Michelangelo tonight. I don't do this very often, I can assure you. Right, now, now that we've got it all done down to there, I'll start parting it off down here. And you'll notice that I've moved the tool rest right down so as the post is actually in line with the parting thing. Even on these 12 inch rests with a one inch post, they vibrate out towards the ends and you can get a bad cut on there. So I try to move the post in underneath it where it's not going to do much damage. Now I'm just using a 1 8 inch parting tool, which is the standard size one. And I'll cut it nearly all the way through. Geez, who's rearranging the furniture? You've got uh, 27 people watching. Okay. That, uh, Rick, that was just uh, metho. That's all, just to wash all the sawdust out of the way. Now, whenever you're using a parting tool, always make sure you have relief cuts. Even with the diamond parting tools, which I hate, they still can bind up in the groove, so... Left about 25 mil spigot down in the bottom there. I'll lift it out on the chuck in a minute and then we'll paint this. We're going to do a copper coat on it and then put the. Um, gee, what's causing that to shake? Wait a second. Uh, that's better. Um, a little trick with your parting tool to get a nice cut, normally the parting tool leaves a very rough cut if you go down in there, is that you slide this top edge here, this part here, angle it across a little bit and slide it down the inside. So you're cutting with the shoulder of the parting tool virtually. And it leaves a nice clean edge there. Now where you go in there's going to be a sharp edge and likely to be a little bit of fluff there. So always just break that corner of fraction. So it's a nice smooth edge. Right, now we'll take it out of here. Neil's just come in. G'day Neil, how are you? Charlotte had a suggestion earlier there too, Robbo. What? Uh, suggesting a meeting of crosses making a cross hatch. Right, James Pritchard, what is the problem with the diamond parting tool? Okay, the diamond parting tool was invented by manufacturers to make more money. Um, now, I've just got to get a pencil, wait on. 
I thought I had one close by this time. No. Your Landy has just come in. G'day, your Landy. Aha. Uh -huh. Here we go. Right, if you look at the cross section on a diamond parting tool, it looks like that. I hope you can see that in the camera, all right? <laughs> now, their reasoning was that because you had such a narrow area here, they don't bind. But they can still bind because that's the widest part of the tool anyway. But if you put a relief cut in, it doesn't matter what you use. The biggest problem with the diamond parting tool is this, is where it comes down here, into there, there's a ridge runs right along there. If you do not get that point exactly lined up with that ridge, then it just will not cut at all. And I'm saying, well, nothing, nothing much, nothing much astounds me these days. But, but um, the number of people that get the the corner right up here somewhere, right away from here, and then wonder why it doesn't cut properly. I find that the most useful parting tool actually is a 7mm, which is my preferred parting tool size, because I can do little fillets with that and everything else. Okay, get rid of some stuff there. Put some plywood on there so that I don't make a mess of the bed, Neil. Don't make a mess of the bed. Now, this is copper coat, real copper paint. And you notice that I use a, a tin opener, not my skew chisel or a screwdriver. Now, this stuff is as thick as treacle, and it's got to be well stirred. Not shaken, stirred. Looks fantastic in the tin, I must admit, the colour of it. But you can see how thick it is. You've got to make sure that it's well mixed. Uh, Steve, you should have taken that back and got your money back. What? Oh, Steve said when he felt ripped off when he bought a diamond uh, parting tool and it had no diamonds in it. <laughs> oh, they saw Banana Boy coming. Looks like Neil uh, needs to hug the teddy bear that's in his DP. <laughs> why? Oh, he says he's only been in here five minutes and you're picking him already. <laughs> Just wait until I've finished, Neil. As I said last week, I've always been fascinated with Greek architecture and Greek urns and there are amphoras and all of that sort of thing. The next thing that fascinates me the most is uh, who's opening up a, a packet? And why wasn't I invited? It must be said, I've got my microphone <laughs> muted unless I need to say something. Oh, right. Um, I've always been fascinated by the way copper turns green and in some cases reds and greys it looks fantastic there's a there used to be a place down the road from us that had a copper flue on their chimney and I watched it age for about 60, 16 years when I was living there just over the years 
Plus, I'm old enough to remember when my mother used to wash in a copper. Didn't have a washing machine. It used to be a social occasion in the neighbourhood. About five of them would all get together and do their washing. We had the copper. Old Mrs Black down the road had the soap. And who remembers the blue bottle? And no rotary clotheslines. It was a lump of rope with a stick with a fork in it that used to lift the, lift the line up. Starting to show my age now. Right, that's looking better. But as you can... Jaffy, as you can, Jaffy it's copper paint that he's stirring. Copper paint. Like that. Right. Now we'll put some of that on. As you can see, I'm an expert painter. Just up to the rim there. Because this is so thick, I don't want to fill in those little grooves around there, so I'm going to make sure I get it right out of there. And the same on this one here. Steve's saying that copper tone is his favourite colour. Sorry? Steve said his favourite colour is copper tone. Oh, yeah. The thought did cross my mind to ask him that, Neil, but I think he'd just laugh and say no. Sorry, what was that? Turn the lathe on really fast now and watch all the paint go wee! No, that's Neil's trick, it's not mine. <laughs> not if I can avoid it anyway, unless I mean to. dries fairly well it's two hours between coats but you've got to actually put the the oxidizing liquid on just as it's going to touch dry and depending on how thick you make the bottom coat denotes how it's going to turn out so A question from Barry Robbo. Yep. No primer sealer or undercoat needed with that paint? No, no. I, I suppose you could put primer on it if you wanted to, but most of the paints these days are so good that they actually don't need primer underneath them unless they're going to be in an outdoor 
thing and then and then generally I'll give them like veranda posts for instance I always tell my customers because I don't paint them um, that they should put uh, at least two coats of oil based primer not acrylic primer underneath them to protect them but for in indoor stuff oh, geez, I hate child proof lids only only kids can open them. Right. Rinse of the brush out a bit. Charlotte's asking if you're going to put a patina on the copper, Robert. Oh, yes. Yep. Right. Now I'm going to take it out of the lathe. Sit it up there. Oh no, I'll sit it down here where the camera can get it. I'll change cameras now. Just take that one back a bit. This is the patina stuff. It actually annoys me a lot in Australia that we can't buy a lot of the stuff like that you can in uh, England or America, uh, like chestnut products and uh, intrinsic products and that, because it would be absolutely fantastic if we could. Leona is in. Oh, good afternoon. Good evening, Leona. Now, whenever you're using oils or, uh, in this case, for tuners or anything that's going to be added to something, put it into another container, a small one like that. Don't ever dip the brush into the bottle like that because you contaminate the whole lot of it. So, and when I finish with that, whatever's left over just gets thrown out. You can't hang on to it, so um, you just... Put enough in to do the job and get rid of it afterwards. What are we talking about, Steve? Yeah, the problem with the owner is that uh, chestnut and that won't change the packaging. We've got, we've got fairly strong packaging laws here as far as uh, product disclosure and everything goes. And because it's a flammable liquid, they, uh, they're not willing to change to get it over. We'd, we're just not enough people to get it here. That's the problem. I've just got to let that dry for a few minutes yet. Yeah, I could call it the Melbourne Cup, I suppose, Rick. It's all right, I'm just having a drink. No, that's the problem. You're not even allowed to post it. Probably confiscated by customs when they did there. I've forgotten what it was now. There you go, there you go Robo. 
Leona said she'll smuggle some in her suitcase next time she comes to Oz. Oh, that'd be good, yeah. Hi, Mark. Don't, uh, don't come over at the moment, Leona. They won't let you in, unfortunately. Either that or you've got a long swim. Mark, the gentleman wood turn has just come in. Yeah, good evening, Mark. How are you? You did a good job here wigging last night. You're worming at least. But I reckon you should increase your pay rates, you know. Go on strike, you reckon, eh, hey, Robbo? Yeah. Double time for weekends. Oh, definitely. Just needs a few more minutes yet before it... Neil's asking if you should use the heat gun. Uh, I was contemplating it, actually, Neil. I've got to remember where it is now. I think, actually, I'll put it away. That's rather sad. I'll just disconnect myself for a minute and go and get it, all right? Quick, everyone talk about him now. Hashtag fair, ta fair pay for earworms. Well done. We'll hit Robbo up for a pay rise. One of the T-shirts getting sent out. I just worked out where my echo is coming from, Joe. Where? Well, it's not there now. No, it's not. What was it? It's Robbo. Oh. <laughs> okay. How you going, Mike? Hey, yeah, Mike, how are you? There you go, Sid. You can answer that one if you like. You land. I'm going to leave that one for Robbo. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know too. I've got a bit on the little one I was doing this afternoon. Sharp tools, I think, is the main thing. All right. Well, as soon as Robbo gets back in, I'll ask him. Neil, I think it may be the resolution that the camera is in. It may be different from the other cameras. Are you back, Robbo? Has Robbo not put his earphones back on? He might have pushed up against the um, headset and muted it from the headset. Oh, righto. Well, he's not showing up as muted. No, just the actual headset has a mute button on it. Okay. If you can hear us, Robbo, you can check that out. Amy's just come in.
Amy, how are you? How are you going, Amy? Whoa. Oh. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, unless you don't like Mark, you got clothes on. Yeah, I was about to say I'm doing a Mark. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. I think your question might have upset the whole system. Yeah, I think he's maybe. I was just flicking back to my screenshots to make sure I asked the correct question the correct way. So how is everybody today, tonight, whatever it is in your part of the world? It's 8 o'clock p.m. here, so. 8.30 where Robbo and Amy are. Oh, he's back. And my echo's back. Ooh. Right. Well, I don't right. know why. Okay, right. Now... As I was talking to myself before, a little trick I, a little trick I picked, a little trick I picked up from Wayne the Woodturner in England when you're using a heat gun to dry something, always face it away from what you want to dry, and turn it on so as it blows any dust or anything out of the stock, out of the inside of it. Okay, and doesn't put it all over the work you're trying to dry off. Right, that's not going too bad actually. Like, see that spark? I don't know if you saw the spark come out of there. Right, that'll do. Robbo, Temple Boy is quite upset with me at the moment. I've missed his question. Ah. Oh. He said, he asked, can you put a couple of captives, captive squares or ovals on it too, Robbo? I or answered that when I first. Hit. I, I answered that when I when he first came in and asked it, and I said, a bit late now. Rightio, now this stuff, you just sort of, I just sort of put it around there so that it doesn't pick up on the brush, take the copper paint off, and just dribble it down over the side here like this, so that it actually runs down the outside of it, it's like water. Now, both of these are Haynes products. I think Watt will make one as well. But you should start to see it turn, start changing colour fairly shortly, actually. Oh, hang on a minute, Robbo. You're not meant to paint it on yourself. Stop. Okay, we'll just let that sit there for a few minutes now. Now the important thing is that once it dries, it's got to be clear coated because the um, oxidisation will just rub off in your fingers. So. What are you talking about, Pat? And good evening. Same to you, Amy and Pete. Sorry, I'm I'm not sort of not watching the chat. I'm doing other. I'm concentrating more now. You can see it's starting to change now. Uh, Leona was just saying that she's contemplating on whether to pull her electronics apart from her dust extractor and take it outside and that's where Pat oh. was saying oh yeah yeah oh we've got a big one outside as well but because we change our configuration at least every two weeks um, we need a couple of portable ones around as well besides which it's hard to extract all the dust off a 40 foot post I tell you Right now, I'll ask Steve's real question now, Robbo. Yeah. 
As a professional turner, what part of the job has been your main bread and butter over the years? Production or teaching? Production. That's that's an easy easy one to answer. Production turning. Who asked that question? Sorry. That that was Steve, Temple Boy. Oh yeah. No, I woke up I did craft work for about the first three or four years and found out that it was no that I wasn't making any money at it. Mainly because unfortunately in Australia wood turning has always been relegated to the craft, not the art side of things. And um, it, uh, uh, like I said, I couldn't make any money. But people knew who I was. And I thought, I've got to, I've got to do something to make money at this. So I took up architectural turning, turning veranda posts, staircase work, uh, chair legs and table legs and bed posts and all produ all production stuff. There was uh, two, three hundred items at a time. So, yeah, definitely production work. Steve called me a dingo too. Sorry. I said, Steve called me a dingo. Called you a dingo? Yeah, he's mean. He doesn't Not really. Right, as you can see, it's starting to change now. Oh, I missed the spot. Better go around there and do that. No, it has no smell. Well, no, nah, no real smell to it anyway. It's not, it doesn't smell acidic or anything like that, so. Oh, that's that's acceptable, Steve, but calling somebody a dingo in Australia is a bit of an insult. Somebody rang me up the other day and said, oh, how come you only make your lives about an hour long? Well, I'd like them to be about an hour long. They could generally go a little bit long, longer than that. There is another wood turner that comes on at 10 o'clock our time, Victorian time, and I don't want to run into him So, um, because a lot of people in here go in there to have a look at, at Steve, SK Crafts. So uh, we're the entertainment on Sunday night. It's all right though, Rob. I have had experts try to offend me, so Steve's got no chance. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, you work for the government. I do not. Oh, I thought, I thought you did. I'm employed by, I'm employed by the government. Yeah, well, that, oh, well yeah, okay. <laughs> I know, I know there's a difference between employment and working. You can put the uh, link up to Steve's if you like, please, Jay. In the in the chat. Yep. yep. Now the biggest advantage of this is if you leave it on the chuck like that and you don't like it, you can always turn it back off again. But I'm not going to do that on this old eventually take it right off.
but you can see how it's going on the other side now that it's starting to dry out. It's getting that light green verdigris colour. You can see where it's starting to dry up here, how it's getting that light, lighter green type corrosion thing into it. Anybody got any ideas what they'd like to see next week? The only time it's not satisfying, Colin, is when you get blokes like uh, Temple Poi in uh, harassing you. I admit, he's a bit of a gentleman for the first one or two, and then once he gets to know you, he starts harassing you. Uh, good night, Yolandi. I'll get the heat gun onto it as well and cool it down a bit. So uh, Colin's come up with a um, suggestion, Robbo, an emerging bowl. Oh, yeah. Believe it or not, Colin, I have never turned one. But I'm willing to have a go at it. And I don't mind if people laugh. Just have to find a bit of timber to do it with, that's all. Any more suggestions? I might just add a bit more on here I think that was the part I missed the uh, the copper paint may have dried out too much for it to, to take on there I don't know not being an expert in this sort of field No, I haven't got enough time for that, Rick. Yes, I have. I have, Steve. Uh, an urn. No, if I turn an urn, Colin, my wife might get ideas. <laughs> I 
think that's going to stay like that actually, that part. <coughs> the copper dried out underneath it. All right. So Steve suggested he'd like to see some curved spindles in a in a live. Sorry. Steve has suggested he'd like to see some curved spindles in a live at some point. Well, yeah, the, uh, now, normally, the turned parts are straight. But uh, on the chair backs, what they do is they have a special jig, which I've got somewhere around here, um, to uh, hold the curved part in. But you get the the bottom of the leg straight. But yeah, that might it could be interesting. I could uh, I think I've got some tazioka around there. I could make a couple of back chair legs out of. Just to wouldn't quite be the same height and everything, but it'd give you the idea of the way they work. So Ricky's rockets got a set of nesting dolls, and then have you seen the YouTube video of the nesting dolls? Uh, yeah, the the Russian ones. Is that the ones you're talking about, Rick? All right, I'll see what I can do next week for you, Steve. Especially seeing as he said please and everything. Yeah. Don't insult me this week. Okay. Well, that's what it looks like. And that's what happens if you let the copper thing dry underneath it before you get the ox oxidisation onto it. So that's a lesson well learnt. The only problem with the copper paint is that it's very hard to get very smooth. Probably what I would, if you want to really schmick, you'd probably have to let the first coat dry and then cut that back and then put another coat over the top of it. But it's so thick. It is very, very hard to get a thin, like an even coat over the top of it. So Rick's responded to your question there, Robbo. Yes, with the sword like tool. Oh yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got one around here actually. Charlotte asked me ages ago to make one, and I did experiment with it. I still like the, uh, I still like my skew over it. Um, You've got to remember they're using wet timber and they've had years of practice of doing it too. But it could be handy for some things, I must admit, the knife tool they call it, a turning knife. So Jay's just put, uh, I presume that's SK Crafts live link in the chat. Well, actually, it's not too much of a challenge, Colin, because I've made nesting, nesting boxes before. We started off with uh, a 10-inch one. And I think we had 22 by the time we'd finished, by the time it all fitted inside each other. Um, <laughs> so subtle, Neil, so subtle. Well, maybe it did. Maybe it was out. Maybe it was outside the Greek temple, and those bloody dogs—you can, you just can't trust them, you know. 
Joe's backstage again, Robbo. Oh. What, he disappeared, did he? Okay. Yeah, I, I do realise that, uh, Steve, I just wanted to sort of get, give people the idea of what it looked like and everything. So, I hope I succeeded in that. Like I said, I'm not an artist, I'm a turner. Yeah, that's who we'll blame, Billy. Only, geez, it might be a bit tall for Billy, I think. <laughs> but yours, yours are much taller, Pat. Billy is a Chihuahua cross. Only he's a little, like a little rat. <laughs> yeah, could hold it up in a left hander, I suppose, or a right hand. All right, well, next week, just to keep you happy, Steve, I'll do a pair of back chair legs. Yeah, there's a house in um, oh, Turak, which is one of our upmarket suburbs in Melbourne, that has a copper roof on the uh, conservatorium. And oh, it looks just, I had to replace all the verandas and posts in it. It's about 120 years old, that house. And I just sat there for about half an hour one day eating lunch, just watching, looking at the roof. It was so good lovely green tint right across the top of it. Okay, well, I might call it a night. It's a little bit earlier tonight than most nights, but... Uh... Thanks, everyone. Good to see you all. Foxy Cross. All right, take it easy. Keep safe. And uh, hopefully get out of this bloody pandemic thing shortly, I hope. I, I must admit, it doesn't make much difference to me because I work by myself all day, every day anyway. But uh, I do miss my interstate trips of annoying people. So, okay. Thank you very much for your attendance. And with that, we're out of here.